Thanks. Uh, I'm sure people have comments, but I actually wanted, to hopefully, um, to ask David. I know, David, you're over there. Are you paying attention to us? Could somebody hit David? <laughs> I would really like well, to I mean, ask right David, because David's, a, you know, I think unique here possibly in being, well, this isn't totally fair, but the most experimentally oriented. Would that be fair to say? And so I think you have, you know, a unique perspective, whereas the theorists really sometimes have to just think completely at a meta level about their work, I think, you yeah, know, we, you have we, a different perspective. Yeah, experimental don't think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because we thinking, e David, thinking equals philosophy, <laughs> and what you do is science. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I like, I think Massimo's um, presentation is very helpful and goes right to the heart of the matter for me, which is, so I learned a lot, and it's been extremely valuable, but what I had hoped to learn as, an, or take away as an experimentalist is more about the putative continuity, I think you had, Massimo, in your prison there, the continuity between, let's say, philosophy of science or philosophy of mind and the things that I have to worry about as a lab scientist. And that is, seems to me completely elusive at the moment. So I had hoped in the context of a discussion about naturalism to really find, let's say, conceptual alignments somehow between the concerns we have you know, in the bench or whatever you'd like to call that, and the concerns you have and I didn't feel that at all. It's, it's not clear to me what I'm supposed to take away as a practitioner that changes how I do my business in terms of uh, you know, experimental design, for instance. And what types of questions am I supposed to uh, address in which way to deal with the challenges of, of naturalistic inquiry? So, has that so it has regrettably not changed my mind about how, you know, what kinds of questions I can address how to address them, and that's that's what I what I wanted, I guess. I wanted a closer, more specific you know, <clears throat> uh, alignment. It's curiosity driven. Because how can we put our heads together and figure out how your philosophical concerns can merge with what we can actually accomplish to come up with kind of mechanistic causal me uh, stories about how stuff works, and but, and that's hmm. not yet there, and that's that would be my yearning, as it were. So here's one one suggestion that's. Pretty close to you, actually. Um, the bunch of experiments that w were mentioned and never carefully described were Ben Libet's work, and then soon at all. There's a whole lot of it, uh, um, and some of us believe that those experiments are badly done in the first place. At least Libet's were, um, and that what the scientists said about them were extremely naive theoretically and that there's now the problem that a lot of non-scientists hear these proclamations by scientists, not by philosophers, about the implications of this work and that are, that are ill-founded and it seems to me here is an area where where, where experimental scientists, if they think they've found something that is of, shall we say, philosophical importance, and they may, I, I certainly think there are a lot of experiments that really undo traditional philosophical ideas in an important way. That's been my stock and trade over the years, really, is pointing these experiments out and sort of rubbing philosophers' noses in some of them. Mm -hmm. But I don't think those I don't think the Libet experiments are, are cases in point. But I then, agree. but then the, there is a question about what should the experimental scientists do when they think they've uh, uncovered something of 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 more than interest just to their particular experimental discipline, but they think it has a sort of earth-shaking results. I agree with Dan on this. Um, that's one example. Another one, which I could say my own work has been informed by philosophy, is, is Phil Kitcher's analysis of evolutionary psychology. Um, I think philosophers have the tools to be able to, the analytical tools to be able to see whether a conclusion follows from certain assumptions that, that scientists aren't trained to do. So the way I think about the evolution of human behavior has been changed by these philosophical ruminations. Of course, that's only because <laughs> Phil is deeply acquainted with evolutionary psychology that he was able to do that. But I think there's some a set of ways of thinking about things that scientists can benefit from. And, and
So that puts the, that, 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 that's fine. That puts the thing squarely in, in our court. It says, we're supposed to do experimental research. Maybe it's even good. Maybe it's like Libet's experiment's not so good. And, uh, and then, but you surely internally criticize those experiments. Anyway. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Sure. So, but now the burden is to say, well, we think it has interesting interpretation, so we're, I'm supposed to come running and say, right, help so, me sort out the logical yeah. structure. Right. Yeah. No, Dan, so Dan little... posed the question, what should they do? That yeah. was verbatim yeah. your question. Yeah. And, and so you're repeating it back. What should we, what do, should we do in do? your estimation? Yeah. I think the terms of trade are in the other direction. <clears throat> we need to attend much more closely and carefully to laboratory work. Yeah. And naturalism as a philosophical movement shares probably universally its obligation to let what you tell us the facts are lead the philosophical and the theoretical discussion with the critical proviso that of course we have to Examine what the what what the descriptions of the laboratory yeah. results are. Very so, I mean, I, but I'd like a stronger burden. I'd like you yeah. guys to take a. I mean, to I I would like to adopt the rich and you know well reasoned philosophical tradition to yeah, inform. You decide on your more. experimental agenda on the basis of where your curiosity drives you, not yeah. on the basis of some uh, uh, extraneous philosophical Wait, theory. What but Alex, you? let's. Oh, I'm sorry. Just just quickly, what, Alex. Um, what we do. You know, I mean, experimental scientists often test a theory. Sure. And so, in cool. some sense, maybe David's asking, "Are you promoting any theories I can test in the lab?" Would that be one way of phrasing it, I mean, or that, are you that, saying, in a sense, too that Jerry operationalized? Says, that's trying to translate down, you know, a larger scale position into, you know, am I measuring this or that in my, you know, in my dish or something like that? But, I mean, I guess it would be nice to find. You know, sort of the cone of direction of argumentation, the kind of data that would, for instance, help you. That's not so you mean, obvious. You would like philosophy to generate the data? No, no, no. I, I, no, no, no. Experimental design from philosophy? <coughs> to gener to no, generate. I think, I think you can so get I it. Also, so I also no, no, not to generate. Obviously not the data. The generate. So the, 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 I mean, it would be helpful to, look, let's take the discussion yesterday afternoon, which was a little weird about meaning. I mean, there's lots of stuff we know. I mean, there's you know, great work in cognitive psychology, psycholinguistics, linguistic theory from the last 50 years that we can draw on that is actually pretty detailed and we can test that stuff. Now, there's disagreements in this room about whether that's important or not. That would be useful to know about. Is, is this kind of position worth testing? Is this kind of position worth testing? In the way I then developed the experimental details and acquired the data. So there, I think the alignments can be more close than they have seemed to me at the moment.